Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of the Life Hacker Podcast. I'm Adam Dotches and I'm here with Alan Henry. Hey, what's yeah. going on? And Thorin Klasowski. Hey there. Hey, how's everybody doing? Good. Not too bad. <laughs> it's it's awfully uh, it's awfully chilly here in LA. I think we hit 58 degrees. For my, and I have to put on a sweatshirt. So it's the this awful winter. I don't know if you guys are experiencing such that's, weather. That's terrible. It's like 60 something degrees here in Washington D.C. So we're all thrilled that it's not like 20 like it was oh, earlier wow. in the week. Yeah. You actually have us beat. That's a I'm not expecting that. Never happens. <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't. I don't want to talk about it. It's cool <laughs> here. <laughs> All right. Well, then let's talk about the news. We have a few stories and some top stories, so let's just get into it. So first of all, Google added hands-free voice search to Chrome. So just kind of like this is very easy to understand. And essentially, you just you don't have to tap the microphone to search. Just kind of like you do on the Moto X, you can say, "Okay, Google," and then Google's like, "What do you want?" And then you tell it, and it searches. So that's a nice benefit to Chrome because I think one of the more frustrating things about using the browser voice search is that you actually have to go to Google.com and click on the microphone and you know go through all the trouble. So good job, Google. We uh, we all appreciate it. Um, Alan, something happened with CyanogenMod, I believe. Yeah, uh, a while ago we talked about how the CyanogenMod. Uh, team put an app in at Google Play that lets you essentially just go ahead and install CyanogenMod. I mean, it would do all the checks, make sure your phone was supported, and then it would go through the install checks, and it would just help you uh, go ahead and, and walk you through the installation process. Uh, well, that app, which was really, really awesome, has now been pulled from Google Play. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Google pulled it down saying that what was the official, it encourages users to void their warranty, whatever that actually means. Uh, in reality, I understand what it means. I mean, you know, rooting your phone and, and tweaking it and installing a different version of Android would, makes it largely unsupportable by carriers and manufacturers, but uh, it's still kind of sucky, and it's probably Google kind of relenting to a little pressure from those, those camps to yeah. keep people from rooting and installing new ROMs. That's too bad. I really like... There, I feel like there's a brief period with Google... Where I think when they uh, released the first Chromebook, they had like an auto rooting mode on it, the the CR12 or whatever it was, and and I I felt like the spirit of of I guess everything of all Google hardware was going to maybe go in the future to you can just click a button and root it, and we we want we want to let you have the freedom over your device, but I mean clearly that didn't happen. Yeah, That's it's kind of. It's kind of unfortunate, but I mean, on the bright side, just like so many other Android apps, you can still sideload it if you want it. So it's not like you can't use it. Yeah, that is nice. At least there's always there's always a silver lining with Android. When Apple kills stuff, it's just dead. Well, until jailbreak, anyway. <laughs> um. So Thorin, how about this uh, password compromise? Yeah. So you know, sometimes things get hacked. And in this case, a bunch of things got hacked. Um, a bunch of major, uh, hacker just got a bunch of passwords for Facebook, Gmail, Twitter, Yahoo, and uh, LinkedIn, all of which have two-factor authentication, I think. Um, and that's about it. <laughs> if your password was hacked, uh, you've already been notified, and your password's been reset. None of the sites were actually hacked. It was just a keylogger grabbing a bunch of passwords. Um, which the the funniest piece of information from that is how many of those passwords were one two three four five six or other very vari variations on that. So yes, yeah. it's not surprising, but it's still sad that 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 I, 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 like we're moving on to two factor authentication on LinkedIn and <laughs> or or everywhere maybe maybe I don't know, but and but then uh, we're getting to that point where we have a password and a thing. And our passwords are complicated, and some of us don't even know our passwords. But there's still, but there's still people who haven't made the jump. It's like it's like not making the jump from dial-up. They haven't made the jump from you know their default suitcase pin code. Mm -hmm. Mel Brooks's suitcase pin code. <laughs> right. So it's just uh, that's is it. I don't know why it like it's it surprises me. And it, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, but it does still. I feel I feel like. 
we ought to be I mean, because Facebook's new enough that that should happen. I, you know what? Do they? Why don't they? Why? Why don't any of these services require a complicated password? I don't know. Uh, because I think there's always going to be that one person who's like, "I want my password to be password," <laughs> and then if they don't, if they can't have it, then they will freak out. I uh, a long time ago, I used to work uh, tech support at a government agency. I work for a contractor not too far from here, and I will tell you some of the most important people in that office insisted that their password be something like password because they just didn't want to remember it. Their mindset was, I've got so much other crap to worry about, my password's going to be password, and that's just the end of it. I don't care about your policy that says it needs to change every <laughs> 72 days or have letters and numbers and capitals in it, you know? Uh, so well, I think then, that, then, then your policy can be like, well, then you can just not work here. That's an option. <laughs> most companies, I, I don't think that that, that was a while ago. I hope that still yeah. doesn't fly, and I hope that guy isn't still there. But <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in this day and age of two-factor authentication, on LinkedIn and password managers like you know LastPass and Dashlane and all those services. I I would hope that we are getting people to use those things so when they're hacked they can just click a button and generate a fresh password as opposed to you know make their password one two three four five six. Yeah, I mean I get I get the not wanting to have to remember a complicated password or whatever, but. You, it doesn't really have to be because there. Uh, my favorite thing is the are, are those three word passwords where you can you can make a password I love cake and just put spaces in between them and it's actually quite that one's maybe not the greatest because the words are short but um, it's it's a very simple password and the spaces between it make it very hard to very hard to hack so I, I just feel like if you really if you really feel like your password needs to be password then then you could make it remember this password, and as long yeah. as the spaces are in there, then you're good. Or my password is password one two three four five six seven. Then you got yeah. all those things. <laughs> yeah, just get the spaces in there, or like a dash or something. <laughs> Put an exclamation point at the end, and then it's unhackable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Before anybody emails, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hopefully, well, you know, I want to say hopefully, but I guess I guess it's you know with all the with all the one, two, three, fours out there, there might be someone who doesn't know. So we should, I, and I, I guess, I guess, you know, thinking about this now, it's not really, it's not entirely fair to criticize because there's not a lot of education out there about, I mean, we obviously write a lot about how to make a good password, but it's not like, you know, you go to school, it's not like high school students or, or children or, or, I mean, maybe you learn about it at work, but you know, there's no, like, there's no actual education about technology. For the most part, I mean, the stuff that we really ought to know to stay as safe and secure as we can. You know, I do so much, but oh well. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll all learn more. Just keep talking about it, I guess. Yep. So, on that note, Alan, how, how help me buy a suit? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was that was my order of the week this week. I, I talked to uh, some style experts at. Uh, a kind of measure to order uh, online clothing company called Indochino uh, to come up with a guide on how to buy a single versatile suit that will work in pretty much any situation, right? Uh, so, just spoiler, I I actually do, I mean, you might not be able to tell it when I'm on the podcast, but I actually do like formal wear, so I have no problem putting on a shirt and tie or, you know, putting on a suit or whatever. Uh, so, I kind of had a lot of these tips down already, but in general, the three things that you have to worry about when you buy a suit are the fit of the suit, the general style, and what you're buying it for. And obviously there's a whole lot of rules that go into how a suit should fit. We get into a lot of that in the post. But um, the, the, big, the big thing is that a lot of people buy a suit that's too large and they think that they need to have a lot of room to move around in it when in reality they look like a, uh, they look like a kid in their dad's <laughs> Suit, you know, um, but and then they'll go and buy like uh, the, our style expert was really big into the modern look. Modern suits are skinny suits with the waist all tucked in and everything, and you know, really small pants and whatnot. And I, I'm not a big fan of the of the skinny suit look, mostly because I mean, I'm obviously not a, a super skinny guy. <laughs> but uh, if you buy a suit that has kind of a the classic kind of timeless look about it, you can wear it 
at a wedding, you can wear it at a funeral, you can wear it for a job interview, you can wear it uh, with drinks with the fellas, you can wear it anywhere you want to wear, uh, you want to dress up, and then all you have to worry about is changing some of the accessories. Like you put on a tie, you don't wear a tie, you wear a little pocket square, you don't, whatever. Those things, uh, it, it, those things let you take the same piece of clothing and wear it in multiple situations. And that way you don't have to spend a ton of money on like, you know, suit for this and then a suit for your wedding and then a suit for a funeral and all this other stuff. Yeah, I got myself a Pee Wee Herman suit. <laughs> and and it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a skinny one, but I think it's a slim one. And I realized after getting it, I let I do let, I say it's a Pee Wee Herman suit because if I put the red bow tie on, it would be pretty close. But it's um, it but but it 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 it's not the most versatile thing in the world, and so I think that's the value of of the advice that you give in this post is that it's good you you can get non versatile suits, but it's good to have one that you can wear interchangeably for all the things that you mentioned. So thank you, Alan. <laughs> no problem. I'll be using that when I when I cough up another four hundred dollars to <laughs> to buy to buy a nice suit, or maybe less if I can if I can manage. Some of the great tips uh, that some of our comments mentioned, you know, you can go to like Goodwill or something, and if you can find something that fits well and hangs well off the rack, uh, you can take it to a tailor and have a tailor yeah. to your measurements, and then you spent thirty dollars on something that looks like it like it was made for you. So mm. that's something to consider too. Tailors are way yeah, cheaper. I, what? Like, tailors are way cheaper than you think. Yeah, they are. like <laughs> absolutely. I had to buy the wrong size of pants for my suit because they were just out, and I didn't have time to wait for them to get new ones. So I just went to a tailor, and eight dollars later, uh, it was done. <laughs> I mean, my pants fit perfectly. It's really, it's really nice. I, I completely agree with that one. Mm. Well, you always have to get pants tailored too, because they're always longer. At least any time I bought a suit, the pants are always like made for thirty-eight foot tall people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of. I don't. I don't think any pair of pants was. I, I think mo most of the time, mo well, most of us are just not the fit model that they're made for. <laughs> not even remotely. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm exactly the right size. All clothes fit you, no matter what. <laughs> so Thorne, does Jay Z wear a suit when he gets? Uh, he does. So my tip is to allow. Jay Z to purchase your suit for you, <laughs> and other things. Um, actually, so we do these uh, productivity tips from history posts, and uh, we decided to do a not historical one this time around uh, in celebration of Jay Z's birthday. Because why not? <laughs> um, and so he, I mean, Jay Z's a prolific guy, so he's done a ton of different things. And my favorite thing that I kind of gathered from this is that he doesn't take notes anymore. Uh, and he willingly admits that he loses tons of song lyrics and stuff this way, but he no longer writes them down. He just repeats them in his head, continues to do it over and over and over again until they sort of solidify and sort of trains his memory that way. So he just remembers lyrics, and that's why he doesn't forget them on stage or anywhere else. I do that <laughs> when I'm out rapping. I mean, mm -hmm. but no, no, I mean, I actually don't. I don't write. I, I do write things down sometimes, but for the most part, I, I don't anymore because I... I, did, I, I think I do, adopted this policy out of laziness, but mainly I figured if it's really important, I'm going to remember it. And if I don't remember it, it's not that important that I, you know, if I'm reminded about it later. I think this really drives people crazy, honestly. I, I think the same, a lot of people off this way. Yeah, I have the same pol policy. And actually, oddly, I wrote a post about that like a year ago or so, and people oh, were yeah. pissed off in the discussion. Like, people were angry at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what do you mean you're do? Just write it down, you idiot. It's like, I don't know. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I'm like Jay-Z. I'm not going to write it down. Yeah. Nice. It's all coming back. <laughs> but, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a worthwhile post, I think, to kind of take, take a, you know, some of the weird things that he does and uh, see if they apply to you, and you can take anything away from them. Yeah, I always love those. It's nice to kind of see what interesting things people are doing. It's Because that, that's the thing. Like, it, you know, stuff, a lot of it may not apply, but it, it's working for somebody, and... If, and if you think, oh, I should be doing that, there's sometimes you just need the go-ahead to stop taking notes. Mm. You know, <laughs> I, I've always wanted to not take notes, and now, now I can. <laughs> take notes. Um, so my top story for this week is about cholesterol. We were uh, we were thinking about it because there was a, a recent recommendation change, which I won't get into all of that right now. But it's 
it's topical. And we, we were kind of wondering, like, so what does cholesterol actually do? What is, what, you know, what, when is it bad? When is it good? What should you do to maintain healthy levels in your body? And just in case anyone's not terribly familiar because, it, you know, you eat cholesterol and, you know, what does it mean? I don't, I don't know if everyone actually knows what it, what it does. And it's, uh, it actually uh, helps your body uh, do quite a few things. It, um, it uh, creates the bile salts that aid in fat digestion. It can create vitamin D. It, it uh, helps, I guess, you know, create the, the cell walls, maintain their integrity. And so these are all good things for you. So you want cholesterol, and your liver produces it, and you get um, something around a, a thousand milligrams. I really hope that number's right. I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, it's a thousand something, and and your liver will produce it. And if you eat it, it will produce less. If you don't eat enough, it will produce more. And so basically, if you're eating cholesterol, uh, a lot of people think eating cholesterol means you're going to get high cholesterol and you're going to have a heart risk in disease for uh, you're going to be at risk for heart disease. There we go. And that's not necessarily true if you're in if you're eating a, a fair amount of cholesterol because all pretty much all foods have some amount in it, and some foods have more than others. So eating that is fine. It's actually really uh, the you've probably heard that there's bad cholesterol and good cholesterol, and that's kind of a misnomer. But uh, they're talking about LDL cholesterol being the bad one and H, HDL being the good one, and LDL particles. They're like little little fatty particles that um, that that uh, carry the cholesterol, and those are the problem. Those are the indicators for heart disease. So that's what they're actually looking for when they're trying to assess your risk. So the, so what 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 this all really comes out to is that um, you can eat more cholesterol. You shouldn't. You should just eat. eat what you want to avoid really is what you want to avoid. Generally, when looking at a diet, is avoid fatty foods. Avoid eating, you know, empty calories and things that aren't healthy and concentrate more on fiber and that sort of thing so you feel full and you're not getting, uh, and you're getting nutrient balanced foods. So it, it, it's essentially all that. And if you have high cholesterol, being active, doing some exercise, you don't have to do a ton, you just have to do, you just have to stay relatively active. That can lower your cholesterol better than uh, making dietary changes according to the experts we talked to. So I basically told you everything that's in the post <laughs> You can. It will be in the show notes, just like everything else we've talked about so far. So that brings us to our questions today. We have a few, but of course, this is uh, we're always doing this live, almost always doing this live. And uh, if you're watching the Google Hangout, please feel free to ask questions. Some of you have already gotten started on that, and we will answer as many as we can. But let's get started with the ones that we have in the queue already. Coz Zombie Guru asks. On iOS, Android, and Windows Phone, the party on the other end can secretly add you to a conference call where, without being, without there being any indication. How do I tell my carrier to disallow this? Or at the very least, is there a way I can be notified if added to a conference call? Um, not that we're aware of. I don't think you guys, you guys have no idea if there's a way you can tell, right, or block it. No. Yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think there's a way. I know that when conference calls are done, There's you, you, the call has to be temporarily put on hold and connected. So it's 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 kind of hard to, I, I feel like it, it takes time. You notice that someone's missing. Mm. So I guess if you listen to it a little bit, maybe you'll know. Um, I'm not, I, I'm not really sure how people are getting away with it without, without being noticed, but I, I don't, I, I don't really think there's a way to prevent that. Um, I think you just have to be diligent and maybe tell people don't do that to you if you don't want to. Um, I, I, course, usually, I usually just loudly ask, am I on a conference call? And then I tell a joke to see if anyone laughs in the background. Yeah. For, for every call that I answer. <laughs> That's all for all for So So our suggestions are tell a joke, <laughs> deal with it, or... <laughs> yeah, that's. I think that's all we've got, unfortunately. But if anyone actually knows of a way to block this or, or something like that, let us know. We'll uh, we'll update on the next podcast. Um, so next question comes from a caller. Hi, this is John from Savannah, and I'm building a PC for my parents with an SSD drive in it, and I want to migrate their uh, Windows Office 3 2007 software uh, from their old PC hard drive. Uh, onto their new computer and, and trying to find the best, easiest way to do that, assuming they do not have the disks or they downloaded the software. Um, I know 
they bought it legitimately, but they're not too good about keeping records. Thanks. Okay, Alan, this sounds like you've got an answer for it. Yeah, so the first problem is, I mean, you can, if he doesn't have the disk, Microsoft isn't really great about kind of saying, oh, if, as long as you have your key, that's what you're really paying for. Here, have the media, and you can, you can use it to install wherever you want to. They're not really great about that, especially something like Office 2007, which is, you know, a little ways, a little old. Um, so you're going to have to, you're going to have to find another download for the for the actual media, which sucks because you know the legality of that is questionable at best. Yeah. Um, if you have the if you have the key though, then as long as you have media, I mean you can borrow somebody else's media or whatever. Um, you can install Office on the new computer. The trick is getting the key. So in uh, the About screen, you know, if you go to Help and then About Microsoft Office, or on the Mac, you can, it's probably still Help and About Office. If not, you know, Microsoft Office and About Microsoft Office. Uh, you can view the product key. Now, that's kind of a, sh a truncated product key. It's missing some digits uh, if you're going to put it in the into the install media, but you can use it as a start. If you need to call Microsoft and get your key uh, again, you can give them that and then they will kind of reauthorize the installer. They'll give you uh, a product key you can use. Or alternatively, you can go download an app like, uh, like Magic Jelly Bean or one of these other kind of system uh, utilities that will s show you all of the, the serial numbers and keys for the software you have installed on your PC. Then you can pull the key right out and put in the media from wherever you happen to get it, and then put the key back in, and you're good to go. Cool. That actually sounds like it would work really well. It's something I've done a few times. <laughs> yeah, it's something, I, I don't know why they don't just allow you to take the serial number out. I mean, maybe because it's older and there's not an authorization process. It, it, it's not that old, though. No, but it's I, not that old. Somebody on Twitter uh, just earlier this week asked me the same question about, I think it was like Windows 7. They're, they're like, oh, what do I do if I don't have my Windows 7 disk? And I wish I could have said, well, you can just go to down, go to Microsoft and download the ISO and use the media because the ISO itself is worthless without a product key. If you can get yeah. your own product key, they're like, I have my key. But Microsoft makes it really difficult for you to do that, and I don't know why. Too bad. Yeah, it seems like most of the companies are changing. Microsoft, for some reason, has not. I mean, I just, the Cubase, the software we record the podcast with, uh, forever, forever they have been on. Um... Sorry, hold on one moment, please. <laughs> we have we have a technical difficulty. Speaking of Cubase, <laughs> no, making mistakes, uh, it stopped recording our audio temporarily. So thanks, Cubase. But um, with the uh, with with uh, downloadable software, uh, Cubase for I'm on, it's on version. 7.5 now, which I think is actually a misnomer. I think it's on version like 14 technically because they renamed it at one point. And forever you had to order the box and they finally allowed me to download the new version uh, that just came out yesterday. So I, I'm very happy about that. I'm a little less happy that it's not succeeding in recording properly, but that's a, that's a fun problem for later. Um, <laughs> the good news though is that uh, our audio has integrated. So, just a new fun technical difficulty there. But anyway, we have other questions to get to, so why don't we move on to those. Um, Samantha asks, I'm a Mac user but have hated iPhoto for years. First, should I? Okay, well, let's answer that. Yes, you should. Yep. An Uber geek from back in the day told me that iPhoto is terrible because it makes, a copy after, it makes copy after copy of pictures as edits happen, and that is stuck in my head. That is true. Yep. Yep. Um, does the iPhoto library and its copies make a significant difference on my computer's available space? Yes. What are my best options? We'll get to those. Should I just accept iPhoto and leave it at that? No. No. Is there any way? <laughs> there are a lot of these. Is there a way you uh, to just? Is there a way to have just a bit more control over my files with an iPhoto? Uh, not really. Should I care? Yes, you should. Soren, you found something new recently that you like a lot, so why don't we start with that? Um, well, actually, to be fair, first off, I am lazy and just use Dropbox and Flickr and don't organize my photos at all. But that said, um, 
there is an app that just came out called Unbound, which is a, a library. It's just for photo libraries, and it kind of works like uh, Picasa used to before it started getting all integrated with Google Plus and everything else. Um, so it's like iPhoto. It's just for organizing photos. It doesn't move photos into a container. It doesn't move your photos at all. It just lets you organize photos in the app so you can easily search for them and use them. It's super fast, super easy to use. And if I was the type who actually organized my photos, that's how I would do it, for sure. Cool. So I would check out that. If you want a photo organization tool, I think that's one of the better ones that's out there right now. And there's a free trial, too. Cool. There's another option if you want something more like Adobe Lightroom. There's something called Light Zone, and it's free, and it's really amazing how in depth and, and great it is. For especially for free. like it's great on its own, but it's a, it's incredible that they're not charging for it at all. Um, but I like you, Thor, and I organize in Dropbox, or I guess I don't I don't know how organized you've gotten with it because it sounds like not a lot. But I just I make albums and organize them by date, and I have little tags in front of each thing so. That, so in the folder list, they're alphabetized properly, and I actually uh, wrote a post about this, so we'll link to that in the show notes, too, along with the, those two downloads. So those are our questions in the queue. Um, we, have, we have a few on Google+, Plus, so, and we, ha we have quite a bit of time, so we're going to get to as many as we can and, and can actually answer, because there are always a few that we don't know the answers to. <laughs> um, and in fact, I'm not sure we know the answer to um, Mountain Dew Guy 2001's question, which is, hey, how can I boil water faster? I know how I do it, but I feel like, Alan, you might know something better because you're saying <laughs> you, food and science are your things. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the, the way to boil water faster is to move to a higher elevation. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm move to Denver. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's pretty much it, that's what's going to happen. Either move to a higher elevation or apply more heat over a greater surface area. Like, I, I mean... <laughs> A lot of people think that you can boil water faster, like especially if you're making pasta by like putting salt in it. That's not true. I mean, it, it makes it bubble a lot, but you're not really changing the temperature of the water. You're just giving the water more nucleation sites to kind of fizz and whatnot. Um, so, no, <laughs> you can't. If I mean, if if you're working with the same equipment, and if you're not changing equipment, you're not changing elevation. You can't really. I mean, I can't really think of anything you can do. Like turn the burner up. Good luck. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I do have one suggestion, which is a, another bad one. I'm not that your suggestions are bad, but they're you know <laughs> you can't do anything. Um, is if you use hotter water, um, that doesn't need to be that doesn't need to change the temperature as much. So like that's probably pretty obvious. And when you're filling up a pot in the sink, you are generally, I would say, uh, you know, using you're using the hottest water you have available. But I got I started um, using water from a water cooler because uh, which are actually not as expensive as you may think to have on a monthly basis. And I've just been using uh, I've just been removing the uh, using the hot water out of that, and then the water a huge pot of water will boil very very quickly. So kind of a weird solution there, but it's something. Hey, at least that one's actually uh, practical. Mm -hmm. I it's actually, a possibility, yeah. I mean, yeah. I was, uh, to add to that to kind of obvious practical one, it's also use the amount of water that you need. <laughs> like, yeah. If you're, if you're just boiling for, like, a cup of tea, like, just make that much water. <laughs> That's Instead true. Instead of, like, filling it up all the way, which I yeah. used to do and never thought about it until, like, embarrassingly late That's in life. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, I, Phoenix has a non-question that I'm just going to answer really quickly, even though it's not a question. But he mentioned the Dalek in the back to the, I guess, right of my head, um, <laughs> and he liked it, and I like it too. But and I'm just, I just want to mention that if, uh, in the event that you want to get one, they're on Amazon. They come in multiple colors, so <laughs> that's, uh, um, you know, go go out and get that. It makes a lovely Christmas present or holiday present of any kind. I don't know why I got... I go to Christmas and I'm not Christian, so <laughs> that's a, I guess that's just the way the holidays seep in your mind. All right, so we've got a, another question from Mountain Dew. I didn't realize I selected two from him. Um, I recently dropped and broke my iPod screen, and I don't have a replacement plan. What can I do? Do you guys have any suggestions for him? Do it yourself. Absolutely. It, it, it's... You can do it yourself. Um, you know, head over to like iFixit, 
and look up a repair guide. They'll walk you through the whole thing. They will. They'll even sell you the tools. Model along with a busted eye device screen. I mean, because that sucks. Alan, sorry, could you say that again? You cut out a bit. Oh no, I was saying uh, head over to iFixit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the nice thing about those guys, they have repair guides for all kinds of devices, and they will sell you the tools that you need to actually open it up, and they'll also sell you the equipment um, to replace the parts. So they'll walk you through the whole process. It's pretty cool. I think... Uh, <laughs> we are on a technical difficulty. Yeah, we lost Dodges, and now we have two Dodges. <laughs> today is not the day for Google+, Plus, is it? There we go. Welcome back. All right, let's try that one more time. I fix it. Go. <laughs> yeah, so I, I fix it .com. Um, they, uh, they, you may know them as the guys who do teardowns of like every new phone and every tablet and whatever. They uh, what, probably, if it's an iPhone or an iPod, did he say it was an iPod or an iPhone? I believe iPod. iPod. Okay, so they probably have a teardown guide for his iPod. They will. Uh, they probably have a repair guide for the screen, so they'll walk him through uh, opening it up, removing the screen, putting in a new screen, reattaching everything so it doesn't break, and they'll sell him the stuff he needs to do it, including like you know the spudger or whatever tool that you need <laughs> to pry the thing. Up. It's. I think it's actually called a spudger, but anyway, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. it is. It is. So they'll sell him all that crap that that he needs to get the job done. Mm. Also, stupid easy. iPhones look really, and iPods and everything look really hard to. But they all just clip together. It's half the time there's not even screws. <laughs> like they're really easy to work on. Like incredibly easy to fix. Cool. All right. So we got another one from Joni, who says I use my iPhone as a GPS, but when I get a text, it shows up as an alert on my screen, which blocks the map, and I have to click cancel to see the map. Is there anything I can do to disable the alerts without changing my notification settings each time? Um, yes. I don't. There's two ways. I would either change your notifications to banners. I'm like, wondering if she can. But banners would work. You can change everything to banners, can't you? I well, I, no. I'm if she has an older phone. I guess. Uh, I'm not sure actually. Uh, I, n I never know with people's names if they're male or female. Um, but in, so in yes, I, if 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 banners can be changed, yeah, I would I would I would say that makes more sense. But I just I feel like that would be. Because didn't that happen naturally with the iOS 5 upgrade? I don't know. Okay, so, so that's one. That sounds right, yeah. Banners or, or, or do not disturb would be the two things, but I would suggest. But those are both newer OS things. Yeah, do not disturb is a, is a, is a lovely feature. Um, so, okay. Uh, <laughs> that, that works out well. Um, there it, Matt has a... Uh, an answer, actually, not a question, for, that says, for MS keys, try using prod, Produkey, P-R-O-D-U-K-E-Y. It is portable and easy to use. Alan, do you know anything about that? Yeah, it's a good app. I, I've, I've heard of it before. I haven't used it myself, but let me make sure that I am thinking of the right one. Yeah, there it is. Recover lost stolen or lost stolen. Woohoo! <laughs> Recover lost Windows product keys and Office 2003-2007. Oh, it's in your soft app. Yeah, it's solid. Okay, cool. It looks it looks like it's dated, but it'll work in this case because it's a 2007 product key that that, uh, that he needs. That she needs. He needs. Awesome. Someone needs. Someone <laughs> yeah. needs. He needs. All right, so we got a we got a question from Matt. Actually, I have a Nexus 5, and I'm going to Mexico. Should I wait to get there to buy a Telcel Amigo prepaid SIM at, to make some calls while I'm there, or is it better to, is it a better option to skip the hassle, activate a SIM online? Or does T-Mobile prepaid support international roaming? Okay, so those are a lot of uh, a lot of questions. He, so presuming he's going to Mexico for a temporary period of time, it, and he has T-Mobile, it might make sense to just use T-Mobile because they're offering free international roaming for data. Oh, for data though, that's just for data, isn't it? No idea. <laughs> I think I think they do offer international roaming for calling, but I don't know what the prices are like, like permanent. Yeah, I'm not sure, but they did. I know they announced free data for everybody. I don't know if it's enough to make. Uh, I know it's it's the the it's not a usage cap. It's a it's, the speed cap is pretty bad. Um, although you can pay a fairly low fee to upgrade it for a week or something like that. 
So I would definitely look into T-Mobile first. I don't know a whole lot about roaming in Mexico because I, speaking of 2007, that was the last time I was there. So, and it cost $3 because I answered a phone call by accident. So that was, uh, that, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the best situation is. I've had, when I've been traveling out of the country, I've had trouble activating SIM cards online in advance. I usually just keep my old ones so that I can try and, uh, and, and get those working again. I can just make the call before I go and say, hey, can you, you know, give me uh, some prepaid credit for this next month, and then they do. But... Um, if you don't have the prepaid SIM card for for uh, Telcel Amigo, then I don't know if it's going to be that easy to do it in advance. I, I'm really not sure. I'm afraid. I mean, do you, have you guys had this experience at all? Not even remotely. Okay, so the I, so I would I would I mean it's not a big deal to wait because you can just kind of go to the store and take care of it there if you have to. Um, but I would definitely look into T-Mobile because I know they've made some big pushes to uh, offer offer more flexibility when traveling abroad and being able to still use your phone without too much trouble. So that may be the cheapest and best and easiest route all around. So I would go there first and then and then just pick up a SIM when you get there if you uh, if you don't have one yet. Okay, so I think that's uh, I think the. I, we we don't really have time for more live questions, but I don't know if we know the answer to a lot of them other than preferences. Why don't we uh, Why don't we answer some of these que preference questions just really quick? Favorite browser for Mac? For me, it's Chrome. What is it for you guys? Chrome. Firefox. <laughs> uh, someone's got it. Someone's got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then um, I haven't found this question on the list yet, but favorite Android phone. Thorn, do you have one? <laughs> nope. You don't have one? No. I am. I'm loving my. I'm loving my Moto X. That's. I. I yes. Yes. Just buy. <laughs> just buy this. Buy this. I, I've. I've got to agree. The Moto X is is pretty nice. I. I think I would probably pick the Nexus Five now, just because it has a lot of the same features. That's true. Although I do like the Moto X's. Uh. The. 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 How it syncs the text to Chrome with the extension, your text messages. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't know if the Nexus Five has something like that, but I'm assuming not because it's Motorola Connect. Um, but I've always been really, at least from a design and just overall functionality standpoint, I really like the HTC One too, but I just don't think it's the best deal. That's good. I, what? Oh, go ahead. Oh no! I was gonna say that when I was shopping for this phone, it was pretty much down to the HTC One and the and the Moto X, and I was thinking about the HTC One because I could root it, install CyanogenMod on immediately. But I just I I was won over one I was won over largely by the touchless controls and the uh, notifications the thing that I use I use both every day. And there's something great about being able to say like, okay, Google now, and things happen. I think my phone just. Went out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and things happen, so that I mean that's that's a winner for me. And it, since it's going to be integrated in more phones in the future, you can probably buy a Nexus Five and expect to get it uh, when the Nexus Five gets KitKat natively, which I think is yeah. coming, but not here yet. Oh, the, the Nexus Five doesn't have KitKat because I because the Moto X has KitKat, doesn't it? Well, the Moto X got KitKat uh, pretty quickly, but I'm pretty sure the Nexus. Five, I'm going to check. That's I don't weird wanna, that the Nexus 5 wouldn't have it. I don't want to be... I think it would have shipped with it. It's rolling out for the Nexus 5. That's oh, that's just very surprising to me. Okay, well, interesting. interesting. Um, and just a quick update for Joni. Uh, the apparently do not disturb is the method of choice. So, uh, good suggestion, Thorin. <laughs> Yay, me. <laughs> so, uh, one, one more question and we'll move on. Um, because I, I saw HTPC in this one. I haven't even read it, but hopefully we'll be able to answer this. Patrick asks, I'm digitizing my DVD collection, and I've been doing research for building a home server plus HTPC. This, I guess, would be really great if what's in here today. Um, is there a good formula for how much storage I need? I read somewhere number of DVDs times 5 gigabytes times 2. Oh, okay. Actually, this is something that... This is something I feel qualified to answer. Um, I just actually upgraded my storage quite a bit. Most of my DVDs come out to a gigabyte to a gigabyte and a half in the in the um, MP4 in H.264 MP4 format. 
um, which is what I usually rip to. Some people prefer higher quality, which is around two gigabytes per movie. So in terms of, and and, and some are going to be more or less because like a cartoon is not going to require uh, compression, the compression algorithm to work as hard because there there are fewer little bits of data it has to figure out. So so if you have a you know 3D animated movie, that one's going to be a, generally a smaller file size. Uh, just because of the simpler images, and then you might have, then if you have Lord of the Rings trilogy, that's going to take up quite a bit more. Those are going to be probably at minimum 2.4, 2.5 gigabytes at a, at a reasonable bit rate of around around 2 megabits per second. So um, in, the, in, the, in the ripping thing, I, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the number of DVDs times 5, uh, times 5 gigabytes times 2, and I'm not really sure why you would times 2 it. But if you're digitizing a collection and you're planning on adding stuff, I think it may make sense to figure out exactly how much storage you need to store what you're getting. And and you can probably, if you've ripped enough DVDs, you've ripped, let's say, 30 DVDs already, you can take that number, the, the amount of space it takes, divide it by 30 and get a decent average. Um, then figure that, then multiply that average by the remaining DVDs you have left to digitize. Um, and so let's say that's two terabytes, then I would say go out and buy four terabytes for your storage because you, then you have plenty of room to grow, or you can have a redundant collection if you don't intend to grow very much. Um, I, I prefer to have a backup of everything, especially if I were in your shoes and, uh, and and ripping everything right now. I would not want. I would feel very sad if I lost all that work that I did. Um, so I, I would get twice as much, and if not four, t- it, it, twice as much for growth, four times as much if you want redundancy. Okay, that's that's my answer. Do you guys have it? You guys agree or disagree with that one? I stream everything, so I have no idea. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you don't. You you you're all honest now. Yeah. <laughs> I also don't want to own. I don't like owning anything anymore. I don't care. <laughs> I, w- I wish I could feel that way. I want to be like that, and I just can't do it. Mm. Alan, where are you at? I'm kind of in between. I have a lot of media on my NAS, uh, and I think your numbers are right on, by the way. But I find myself streaming more than I watch the stuff that's on my NAS, so... Oh, well. I need to, I need to grow up and, and join you guys, because I, 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 I'm, I'm, I have this, like, weird paranoia that streaming's just gonna malfunction, and if I know the file's there, then I can just use the file. I like yeah. having it there. I like being sure. Well, streaming really sucks when Comcast drops as often as it drops for me. Like, I mean, working sucks when Comcast <laughs> drops as often as it drops for me. So yeah, there. I mean, you know, I've I've fallen back on my my owned ripped media several times, and you know, it's great. I mean, it's good to have, especially yeah. if you have it already and you're digitizing your stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh hey, okay. by the way, Spencer Clayweg uh, notes that uh, he has a Nexus Five and it came with KitKat, and I did a little bit more digging, and sure enough, yes, the Nexus Five does have KitKat. What I saw. Uh, just a couple minutes ago, was that the 4.4.1 update is currently rolling oh. out to KitKat devices. So, okay. yes. That makes more sense. All right, interesting. Okay. Well, we're, we're good to go on questions, I think. We've, we, we've got a lot of them today, which is awesome. So uh, let's move on to some tips. Alan, what is your tip of the week? Alan, did we lose yep. you? No. What's your tip of the week? <laughs> I, 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 am, I am here, I am here, I promise. Uh, so, my tip this week is uh, for everybody who stood in line to uh, get a, a PS4 or an Xbox One or uh, any other expensive fancy electronics that they're going to be giving as a gift this holiday season, please, and this is a PSA partially and also a tip, but please test it before you gift wrap it. And I know that there are a lot of people who are like, no, it's not the same. I want to be the first person to take the plastic off and be the one who smells the delicious PVC-ness. But trust me, it it sucks to open this, open up like a brand new PS4 and Xbox One. Specific, I'm talking consoles because they both have massive day one updates. Uh, some of them have been DOA. There are issues reported with some of the devices. So if you do it now and you test it before you gift wrap it, nobody has to open their shiny new toy on Christmas morning or whatever morning you're going to celebrate and feel that utter sting of disappointment that their crap is broken. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or even that you have to run the updates like that. I, I I love opening things for the first time, but I if I if I knew that it was open solely for the purpose of making sure it worked and that it was updated and I could use it right away, 
I would gladly trade that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thing. I don't like opening things, so I would rather someone open my stuff for me and <laughs> go ahead and set it up too, and then throw out all the stupid packaging also. Well, you, you would prefer. Now, there's a present. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you could you could just have someone own it for you and then stream it to you. <laughs> Isn't that what the PS4 does? Can I stream to? Can yeah, I just stream, stream the whole console? <laughs> yeah, you download your car and all that. Yeah, I'm ready for it. <laughs> yeah. So, Thorne, what's your tip? Uh, my tip is attaching pretty much anything together with Sugru and magnets, and Sugru makes a kit for that. But honestly, it's a DIY thing. You could just make your own however you want to do it, but use some Sugru, grab some magnets, attach some stuff to some other stuff. That sounds like a great time. <laughs> um, my tip for the week is, I'm trying to save a few lives today. Uh, not really, but we, 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 had a, we made a video this week called How to Use Your Cell Phone on the Go Without Dying, and one of the problems I've noticed, I, I was, this, this idea came up a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was at dinner with a friend and I saw a fire truck driving down the street and a guy on his cell phone and I just watched as the guy on the cell phone walked into the street still texting not noticing a blaring fire truck coming straight at him and oh. uh, they almost collided but the fire truck noticed he didn't notice and he did, he was shocked when he when he looked up and there was this gigantic monstrous beast in front of him I he didn't have headphones in I don't know how he was this oblivious but I thought okay well there's no education in schools about how to not kill yourself while using a cell phone while you're moving around. So I thought maybe we could make a fun little video about that. So the tips are essentially look in front of you when you cross the street. <laughs> when you notice a change in terrain, it might be a good time to think, oh, well, I'll just put this aside for a minute while I make sure I don't die or run into anything disastrous and, and so on. And then, uh, and then also there are some tips about uh, how to watch while you're walking on the sidewalk, how to uh, how to how to drive without uh, you know that do not disturb mode we mentioned before is a great way to not want to text in the car because the reason I think most of us text in the car is not be we know it's bad we don't want to do it we don't think oh I need to send this text message because I saw a, a flying pink elephant on the street in which case that would be a completely legitimate excuse but um, you, you, most of us pink elephant here what. I see a flying pink elephant quite often. Yeah, but you don't have to drive, do you? <laughs> no, no. You can walk. Um, the, uh, but but yeah. So I mean, generally speaking, you don't want to you don't want to be texting in your car at all, and you wouldn't do it if someone didn't send you a text. So, I think the the main thing to do is just put your phone on silent, put it in do not disturb mode, so you don't know that they come in. Um, and then you won't, and then you won't be distracted. So these are uh, these are a couple of the tips. Some of them are are tongue in cheek. Some of them are actually realistic things that you should do. Um, but most of all, you really shouldn't use your phone when you're moving around and you need to watch things because it's really more important that you don't die. Um, anyway, we have a fun video. Go check it out. It'll be in the show notes. It's on the site right now if you're watching live. But uh, we will we will link you. I'm I'm very happy with this one. I'm telling everybody <laughs> about it. <laughs> That's why it's my tip of the week. So how about some downloads, Alan? You've got a you've got a fun one. Yeah. So Cal is uh, a, a calendar app. I mean, it it sounds like it wouldn't be fun because it's a calendar app, but it actually is pretty cool. A uh, Cal it's a calendar app by the folks behind any any do or any dot do, depending on how you how you want to pronounce it. it which is, I think, uh, our favorite to do app for the iPhone, isn't it? I believe so. Yeah, and it's one of our favorites for Android. It may be our favorite very soon. I have to. I have to try some things. But uh, they just released Cal for Android. It's been out for iOS for a while. And it's kind of a smart calendar that, you know, when you, it, it syncs with your contacts, it syncs with your social media, it syncs with, obviously, Google Calendar and uh, other calendar services like Exchange. And when you start typing in, like, lunch with Bob, it will go through your contacts and say, okay, who's Bob? And it'll find <laughs> out who Bob is, and it'll fill in Bob's name. And if, since, you're set, since you said lunch, it will suggest some places that you are, uh, that are near you that you can go to for lunch. Uh, the whole point of the app is that it makes it easier to schedule things and see all of your kind of daily events at a, at a glance. Um, 
you have like heavy machinery over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a big truck driving by. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. But uh, the, the, the gist of the app is it makes it easier for you to see everything that you have going on at a glance, and it makes scheduling things with people much easier so you don't have to like figure out everybody's contact information or who else is invited. You don't need to remember PIN codes for conference calls and things like that. So it's free, and uh, it's up at Google Play now, and the uh, iOS version has been up at iTunes for a little bit too. Awesome. Aaron, what do you have? I have Can Opener, which is a way to tweak your music audio from your iPhone to make it sound better. Um, it's kind of like a... It, it uses a bunch of technology to do a bunch of different things, but you can basically make it so any pair of headphones sounds good, even though it's coming out of your crappy MP3s on your crappy iPhone. Supposedly, you know. <laughs> For me, it, I use it too because I have like one of those little Bluetooth speakers, um, and I kind of use it to tweak the sound coming out of that, which helped a lot, surprisingly. Um, and headphones too. Um, if you're a super audiophile, it's a way you can tweak where the sound's coming from, how it's you know, a bunch, of, tons and tons of settings that most of us have no idea what they do. Um, but the cool thing is there's presets. So if you own like Apple, any like kind of most popular headphones, there's a preset for those headphones um, to make it sound better. And so, awesome. Yeah, if you're an audiophile dude, I would definitely recommend checking it out. Cool. Will do. Uh, my download for the week is called Parcel. It's for OS X and iOS. It tracks packages. We've talked about some package trackers in the past. One of my favorites has always been deliveries, but deliveries cost some money, and, you, and it only syncs with OS X as a, as a widget. And then our favorite pick in the app directory is Slice, which just scans your email and, and pulls tracking numbers out and then automatically tracks those packages. And that has that is a nice iOS app, um, not, nothing on the, on the desktop side. And so I, I, well, I think it's our best option in a way um, because, uh, because it's so seamless. It causes some security questions for some people because it's automatically reading your email. Um, there's also another problem now because Amazon appears to not be sending tracking numbers in their emails anymore, which is potentially a big problem for people who want to use an automatic service. Um, so Parcel doesn't. Parcel is just an app, and you put the uh, you put the tracking number in. It automatically detects what the tracking number is with over 200 services. It syncs uh, between your Mac and your iDevice. It's a very simple app. Doesn't do anything crazy, uh, but you can get. Uh, you do have to pay a couple bucks a year if you want push notifications. But other than that, it's completely free. So if you're looking for a good package tracker and you're finding slices and cutting it for you, or you don't want to call for money for deliveries, Parcel is the way to go. So I think that wraps us up for today. It's, uh, it's the wonderful holiday season, so before we call it quits for the day, i gotta, I got to talk a little bit about what's going to happen. We are, a, a fair amount of us are going to be in New York for the end of the year uh, meetings, so we probably won't have a podcast next week. Uh, generally, we try to get things going, but because Thanksgiving came so late and we already, we already did a backlog episode for that, uh, we just haven't had a lot of time to, to put these all together, but we're going to try to give you a Christmas present and, uh, and, and not have to skip another week this month. But the, uh, the podcast will probably not be the next week barring any December holiday miracles. So aside from that, uh, the usual, please rate us on iTunes. We love when you do that. You can't rate us anywhere else but uh, that we're aware of <laughs> that, that, that will help. But if you can go in iTunes, uh, rate us, let us know how much you love the podcast. If you don't, feel free to let us know. There are a lot of ways you can do that. You can uh, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. Uh, for Lifehacker, that's at Lifehacker it, uh, for Twitter. For Facebook, it's facebook.com slash Lifehacker. For Google+, it's google.com slash plus Lifehacker. And if you want to find us individually, you can find all of our information at lifehacker.com slash about. Twitter, fo- Twitter handles, email address, social security numbers, whatever you want. <laughs> Um, we also have our, yes, yes, all our passwords. Our, we just dump our last pass account onto that page, so yep. it's a lot of information, but you'll find what you want. Yep. Uh, we have a lovely, wonderful reader-run blog called Hackerspace, and that is at hackerspace.lifehacker.com, and you can follow them on Twitter at Hackerspace Blog. Uh, you can find lots of uh, lots of cool posts. That it's, a lot, a lot of the times, there's stuff I just I, I go on there and I look and I think, why did we not think of that? Um, but that's why we have our wonderful readers. Uh, writing for it, and if you want to be one of those people, it's not too hard to get involved, so just go on there and talk to the people um, that are working on the Hackerspace blog, and they can make you an author, and you can get started 
publishing, we publish some of those some of those articles to the Lifehacker site on a regular basis. So for show notes, you'll find those in the descriptions of, of this podcast. And if you want to find the show notes for any podcast, any th- this one will be up at 5 p.m. today, Pacific time. And all the other notes are available as well currently at uh, lifehacker.com slash the show. That is about everything we've got. I hope you're having a wonderful wintry December, unless you're in D.C., in which case you're having summer again. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time, potentially in uh, two weeks, but maybe, you know, we'll see in one week. But we'll see you either way. Bye.